computer. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Astounding. Okay. So um, uh, if you don't mind, Rob, if you can uh, sort of monitor as I'm blithering away and even for the first speaker or so, and then um, just make sure that to let him in as quickly as you can. Um, sure. I'd like to welcome everyone to the August Pokery meeting. Um, we have uh, a number of neat talks tonight, but I do not see uh, Naya who's going to give our first talk. He yeah. probably can't get in. Sure, and I. Uh, yeah, could be. Okay. Did you send a, an email? No, I think I think I'm going to do that. Okay. I'll, I'll just tell them to go to the uh, the website and click the link from there. Maybe maybe. That Actually, way. give them the link. Give what? Where am I going to copy from? The one that didn't work for me? <laughs> no, the UR, URL. Okay, I'll go to the website. Okay. website. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Apparently, if you uh, click the link to store it into your Google Calendar, it will not copy the link into the calendar. Huh. Oh, and yeah. So Sorry, do that, there. do that again. If you, if you, if you, at the bottom of the email, if you click the link, there's a there's a link there to store it into your Google Calendar. Okay. The reminder: it will not copy that link into your calendar. Yeah. Why would you want that link? It's only well, the most important thing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's the point, right? So. Yeah, that's uh, something to be aware of. Okay, we should actually, uh, John, keep it in mind. Well, after you send the message, keep it in mind. We might be able to change the template for the uh, meeting announcement or something. But I'm wondering. Yeah, if you send a if you send an ICS or a Google Meet um, request, it will store everything in its appropriate format into the calendar. But if you take a uh, text or graphics or whatever through an email, it won't do that if you click the link to store it into your calendar. Okay. There is an option um, to grab those from Zoom, but I, I think, John, you'd have to go in as Randy. Oh, no, I can't do that. Nobody can do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just did, but I had to. Well, okay. I had to call them at, at the wedding so anyway <laughs> oh. hey it's, it's his fault i mean really um so since uh try is not on yet uh would you mind uh rick if we uh push your um talk first yeah i'm good to go excellent okay and then we'll we'll uh fit try in where we can so okay. no, i don't want to do that okay uh, Okay, you should now be able to. Okay, I'll share my screen. Please. Okay. Okay. Uh... Excellent. Can you see my. Uh, yes, we here? see it now. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so um, this is uh, part two of my um, experiments in astrophotography, trying to deal with um, the light polluted skies in right in Mississauga. So I'm in Border Lake, which is almost as bad as it gets. Um, so I'm going to, as an introduction, just uh, first tell you about my setup for astrophotography. So I have a Celestron C925 uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope. Uh, it's 9.25 inches aperture or 235 millimeters if you prefer. And it's F6.3 because I have a Starzona uh, focal reducer. I have a CME70 EC computerized mount and I, I put on a home, home built uh, telescope dolly so I can just roll it out uh, of my garage onto my driveway because I, I don't have an observatory. Um, I have a ZWO ASI 2600 MC color APS-C astro camera and I have a Dell laptop for image acquisition and that's all. Uh, we lost audio. Rick? Rick, we lost audio.
Okay, I, you're Did showing you... his audio. Okay, yeah, uh, it said the host had muted me. That was not me. I think I know who it was, though. <laughs> you gave me too much power. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> okay. So um, how far did I get? So I have a, a Dell laptop for the acquisition and it's on a home built rolling stand. Uh, again, so I can roll that out as well. And for image capture, I use a program called Shark Cap. I typically take 20 or 30 second sub exposures. And uh, actually this program is really nice. It has a free version available, but I use the pro version because it has a really nice polar alignment. Uh, routine in there, which which I use to align. And uh, then I use Deep Sky Stacker to calibrate, register, and stack my sub uh, exposures. And that is free, and it's a wonderful program as well. And then the more expensive programs, I have Star Tools and Photoshop for the actual image processing to bring the raw data into a, a nice photo. Uh, Okay. Okay, so just to uh, briefly remind everyone, or, or maybe the people who didn't uh, hear this before, because of the light polluted skies, I really have three options for deep sky photos. If I don't have a filter, I'm kind of limited to mostly bright targets. Otherwise, it's very long exposures and it's not certainly very good. Uh, you can get broadband filters that block some very specific light pollution sources, but um, like there are now LED street lights and so on. So this is not so effective because they let in a lot of other light. Um, so again, it's mostly bright targets. So um, my choice has been, and as I shared last time, using a narrow band filter because there are, are really a lot of deep sky star targets uh, and, and this filter only transmit very specific wavelengths emitted by Nebula, for example. So I, I purchased this L Enhanced Narrowband filter. It has greater than 90% transmission in two bands. So, um, well, there's different terminologies, but I, I think of it as a dual band filter. Um, so in, if you look at the transmission versus wavelength, in the blue and green, uh, there's a band here that transmits greater than 90%. And it's mostly from O3, which is uh, doubly ionized oxygen. And there's also minor con contribution from H beta, which is a uh, excited hydrogen. Uh, but this is generally a very small signal, so it doesn't really impact anything very much. And the other band that lets through is hydrogen alpha in the red. Uh, and that's from uh, also from excited hydrogen. So we have the O3 signal and the excited hydrogen signal. And, uh, you know, those are really in a, a lot of uh, nebula and other targets out there. Uh, we don't get the sulfur 2 signal that's cut out and everything else is cut out. So even, you know, any continuous band uh, lighting and so on, almost all of it is cut out. And we're just focusing in on these really critical uh, wavelengths that we want. It does cut out uh, mercury vapor and sodium lights, and those are shown in, in yellow. Uh, so it's, a, it's quite a narrow band filter. Um, and so when I use it with a colored camera, of course, my camera sensor has red, green, and blue pixel filters, and those have very wide transmission. I'm showing that below. So for example, for blue, uh, you can see it's, it, uh, it peaks around uh, you know, 460 or something nanometers, uh, but there's some transmission all the way up to 700. The green you can see peaks around uh, you know, 520 or something, but again, it has fairly wide uh, range of, of wavelengths it slots in. And the same with the red, a fairly wide range of wavelengths all the way out well past 700 out of the IR. And so with the filter though, we block out almost all of this stuff. And we just bring in the hydrogen beta and O3, which you can see are pretty effectively captured by the blue and green channel. So those pixels are excited uh, with the, the, that filter range. And then in the red, we get the hydrogen alpha quite efficiently as well, about 
and everything else is blocked. So it's, it's really very effective. All the pixels in my color camera are being used because we have the green and the blue and the red all being used. Um, but we're blocking out a lot of the stuff that we don't want to see from our street lights and so on. Okay, so um, I showed you some initial results last time and uh, you know, I was really impressed with what you can do, but I wanted to try to push it further. So I, I have done a number of experiments since then. The first one is I want to see how faint I could go for a planetary nebula, which emits O3 and H alpha. In other words, can I do something that's really, really faint, even in the city? Second, um, galaxies are most, mostly broadband emission. You know, they're mostly stars. Uh, they do have nebula in them and so on, which emit in O3 and H alpha, but for the most part, it's, it's only stars. So how, how, how well can we really do with a filter like this? And then the other one, which intrigued me is, uh, could I capture a comet with this filter? Would it help me or not? And finally, uh, what are the advantages of trying to do this on a globular cluster, which again is just broadband emission, it's just stars. So, you know, in theory, maybe there's not so much advantage to doing that. Anyway, so I'm going to show you all these experiments I've done over the last number of months. Okay, so this is Abel 39. It's a planetary nebula. Uh, this photograph at the bottom is 3.5 hours of exposure. It's 11 nights in June and July. Um, it's actually a really, really faint uh, planetary nebula because it's uh, quite a large size. I think it's one of the largest in actual physical extent. It's like 5.2 light years across. And in fact, it's even a little bit bigger because it has a halo, a faint halo around it, which I think you can see if you look at the top right, on my expanded version, you can see this uh, glow around it. There's a halo around it. So it's even larger than that. So, um, and it's also quite far away. It's 7,000 light years away in Hercules. So um, I was really able to capture this quite well. And actually, if you compare it, I got this from the NASA site. This is a Kitt Peak 138 inch telescope view of the same nebula. And uh, yeah, I was, I was really happy to see uh, what I was able to do compared to, to that. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, you can do a lot from this city uh, and it's pretty amazing what a small telescope can actually do. Um, yeah, just a, a little information if you're not so familiar about planetary nebula, um, they arise when stars like our sun age. So they, they really have too little mass to supernova. So instead, when they uh, get old and run out of fuel, they start ejecting a lot of their mass into space. And then uh, you end up with a white dwarf as the remains of the star, and its UV light then excites the gas to fluoresce in, in these pretty colors we see in the end. So, uh, so that was, uh, again, I, I was really happy with the way that that experiment worked out. So this is very dim and you could, so you can, you can do pretty much whatever you want if, if the object does emit a lot in, in O3. And, and by the way, there is H alpha in here, although obviously it's, it's blue green, so it's mostly O3. Um, so my next uh, experiment was uh, M106. This is a, a galaxy that's 23.5 million light years away. Um, my final image here is, is like 47 hours of exposure uh, from April to July. We've had a lot of uh, good weather, so uh, I've been able to take advantage of this. Um, so uh, a safer galaxy has a, an active core that has really exceptional star forming because it has a, an active uh, central black hole. Um, the other thing, uh, and, and so you can see my two images here. Uh, they're a bit small. I'll, I'll show you a bigger image in a minute. But on the, on the left, we have a no filter image, just the RGB image. This is 35 hours of exposure. And I needed 35 hours to bring out the faint uh, outer part of this galaxy. The core is quite bright, 
but this fainter part is is very difficult to to bring out because it is it is very faint. Um, the uh, image in the middle and the one on the right, which is an expanded view, are with the L enhanced filter. So this is only 12 hours versus 35. Uh, but you can see, I mean, the background is very dark. It's difficult to actually pick out the outer reaches of this galaxy. But the core shows up very well. And uh, also what you can see, I mean, there are some uh, 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 nebula here, which are glowing in red. There's some uh, blue star clusters and blue star forming regions in, the, in these spiral arms. But there are also uh, two, well, uh, actually there's a number of arms, but it's in two major parts. So there's this red uh, arm that comes out here and it kind of branches into a couple of different arms. And the same uh, this way going the other way where the arrow is, uh, there's another arm of uh, hydrogen alpha that kind of fans out. So there's a bunch of, of arms actually coming out here. It branches out into various hydrogen alpha arms. These are not really uh, spiral arms because um, it turns out they're, they're at an angle to the plane of the galaxy. So they're kind of shooting out of the galaxy. It's not so obvious, but they don't really follow the, the plane of the galaxy. These are actually a result of jets from the central black hole, which is running into gas in the galaxy and, and exciting it to emit in, 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 in the hydrogen and hydrogen alpha. Um, so as you can see, um, while you, I couldn't get too much in the outer regions of this galaxy. You get incredible detail of what's going on in the core of the galaxy by using the hydrogen alpha uh, and, and O3 filters. And you can see the, the, uh, the spiral arms show up really well in, in uh, O3. And so this is the final image, which again is, as I said, 47 hours total where I combined the two images, tried to take the best of uh, both the uh, filtered and non-filtered image. And so you can see everything. You can see the, uh, the outer reaches and, and also the, you know, all the nice detail in these uh, anomalous arms and so on. So again, I, I was really pleased with how this experiment worked. Although again, it's a, it's a lot of time to put in to, to really do this justice. Okay, so this uh, uh, next topic, my next experiment was to look at a comet. Um, and so uh, it's been in news quite a bit, Comet C 2017 K2 PanStars. Um, it's a comet that's been on something like a 3 million year trajectory from the Earth cloud. So this is the first time in, to uh, you know, toward us it was discovered in 2017, somewhere between Saturn and Uranus, and uh, its closest approach to Earth was on July 14th. It was about 277 million kilometers away, and uh, the closest approach to the Sun is on December 19th. If you want to see this, it it is getting brighter with time, but unfortunately, it's getting lower and lower in the sky. But you can still see it into September, probably. Uh, right now, it's it's um, in Scorpius around Antares, um, but it'll continue to get lower, although uh, again brighter. Um, so um, one of the interesting things that I learned about comets is uh, we all know they they often have this nice green glow, and that's from carbon radical C two. And this is actually called the Swan Band Emission. And um, it turns out if you look at the spectrum, so this is the uh, relative uh, light flux versus wavelength. If you look at the spectrum, all these purple dots show lines of emission uh, from different vibrational rotational states that are due to these C2 radicals, these carbon radicals. Uh, and you can see there's some here in the blue but the majority of it is in the green. And in fact, in blue to, toward the green, but it, it really increases in intensity as you go onto the green. 
Uh, and then there's some further out in the green and even into the yellow, but not nearly so intense. And the interesting thing is the Allen Hance O3 bandwidth covers this main peak of green emission really well. So actually this should work very, very well to pick up uh, a comet and, and you know, help me with the fact that you know, our, our skies here in Mississauga aren't very dark at all. And, uh, and in fact, it did uh, work out very well. Um, so at the time I captured this, the comet was, was really faint. It was about magnitude 9.1. Uh, and this was just before close approach because I wanted to get the comet as, as it was higher in the sky. Uh, so as well, I did it over three nights. Again, I only ran an hour each night to, in order to get it when it was at its highest in the sky. Because as soon as you get lower in the sky, you're more sensitive to clouds and light pollution and, and your, your images just aren't, aren't nearly as good. So uh, I spread this out over three nights. And of course, the comet's moving versus the stars. So the nice thing about deep sky stackers, I can tell it to stack on the comet and not the stars. So you stack on the comet, and then you stack on the stars, and then you, you put the two of them together. And you can see, uh, you know, it, it was captured really well. There's a nice uh, long tail that's visible. Um, even though, again, it's, 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 it's not a bright comet at all. <laughs> uh, at magnitude 9.1, but uh, yeah, it, it turned out very well. And again, it's because the emission from the comet matches so well uh, with this filter. Uh, finally, my last experiment uh, was to try a globular cluster. So uh, this is the very famous M13 Hercules globular cluster. Uh, and this image is actually 17 hours uh, taken in July and August. Um, and, you know, when I, I saw this image, I sort of came back to one, one of my favorite uh, 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 movies and, and favorite lines in a movie where David Bowman enters the Stargate in, in the movie 2001. And he says, my God, it's full of stars. So I, I really thought of that because M13 has over 100,000 stars. And the core density is incredible. It's about 100 times that in our sun's neighborhood. Um, so there's a number of interesting things about this image and about this cluster. Um, it's 11 billion years old. So what's kind of interesting, it has a lot of luminous blue stars, which are quite obvious in this image. Uh, yet, if you think about it, any main sequence blue stars should have burned out by now because they're very bright. They burn a lot of fuel. They don't last very long. So how come we see a lot of blue stars? Um, and I, I think there's a, quite a few misconceptions out there uh, about this, but it turns out in, in a lot of these low metal clusters, most of these uh, bright blue stars are blue horizontal branch stars. So they're, uh, they've gone through the red giant phase, so they're old, but now they've gone through their helium flash, they're starting to burn helium instead of hydrogen. So they're sort of like uh, helium main sequence stars now. So they've got new life because instead of burning hydrogen, they're, they're able to burn helium. Um, and uh, so they're, they're very bright. Um, and there, there are a lot of them in, in or the, I mean, they're not so many perhaps, but they're very visible because they're so bright. Um, now there are some stars in here, which are fainter, which are called blue stragglers. So these are ones that again, they're main sequence stars that are older, but they have been re-energized by gaining some extra mass from stellar interactions. So they've stolen some mass from another star or they've uh, even perhaps collided um, because of the, the density of stars in, in this cluster. So, but the, the, these, uh, in a lot of the clusters, these tend to be fainter and, and uh, they're not nearly as numerous as the horizontal blue branch stars. So why did I use a filter for this though? Because I could get a good image without it. I mean, obviously, 
it's nice not having the light pollution in the background. It gives you a really nice black background. And it's not hard to to develop the image out with and without you know contaminated background with a lot of weird light pollution effects. So that's nice. But one of the things I noticed previously is the stars are much less bloated with filter. It really calms them down, reduces their halos and so on. So I, I think I got um, much nicer stars by using a filter than if, if I hadn't. So, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm really happy what you can do in the city with this filter. I think this filter is just amazing. And, and so far I haven't found anything that where I, I kind of, I say I, I don't really want to use it. I, I think it's 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 quite amazing. Um, any questions? Yeah, I got one. Yep. Um, you're taking. You said you're using twenty and thirty second subs for all your imaging. Yes. Now, is that even with the dual band filter? Yes. I'm just kind of curious why you still you know have to have such short exposure. Is it? Is it more guiding or is it more because of the background? I, well, so I, I do not guide. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't want that, that trouble. It turns out, um, you know, you can go through the analysis. Um, these newer CMOS cameras are really, really low noise. Mm -hmm. So there's actually no reason at all, even with a filter to run like many minute long exposures. It, it just, it doesn't make any sense um, because you don't gain anything. The only reason to run longer exposures is because of, of, of read noise in the camera, but the read noise is, is like just over one, uh, one electron. So it, it's, it's really, really, really low with this camera. But, and, but if, um, if you've got 17 hours of 30 second exposures, yep. like how many files are you combining or is it doing it in, in yeah, so so what I do, um, I, I, again, deep size sky stacker is really nice. I typically do one night at a time, you know, which might be, you know, five or 600 images at most. And, you know, that takes maybe an hour to run to do the stacking, registering calibration stacking. It takes maybe an hour, hour and a half. And then, uh, I, so I have a stack from each night and those become my, if you will, super subs. And okay. so I put all those together into one final stack when I'm done. And mm -hmm. that, that takes like five minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really, it's really uh, not that bad. I mean, um, it's, it's a lot of data, but you know, hard drive space is really cheap now. I, you know, I use, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I might use 20 or 30 gigabytes a night. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a big deal. And you don't need to keep the raw data right. forever yeah. anyway. So, yeah, so it, it just, so the other thing is, you know, <laughs> in, living in the city, you know, cars go by, there's airplanes, there's clouds, you know, people yep. walking by, whatever. You know, it, um, if I took long exposures, I'd be throwing most of them out. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about short exposures is, you know, I, I basically keep 100% of them. I, I rarely have, you know, occasionally a plane goes by and I have to, right. to throw out one image, but it's not a big deal. And, and well, I'm out in the open as well, so I'm exposed to wind and everything. So I can't, if, if nothing else, wind would, uh, would stop me from taking long exposures. Right. Yeah, it's completely do it and it makes it so much easier if you don't have the guide. Um, it is a really nice mount, though it, it's, I mean, it, it's, um, it's got encoders, so it knows where it is. So mm -hmm. it, it does a very good job without guiding over 30 seconds. I, I could probably run a minute if I wanted to, but there, there's absolutely no reason to. Hey, Rick, Dennis here. Yep. Um, have you um, considered um, checking out the uh, Alex stream? Optolong L Extreme filter as well, and, and maybe doing a, a comparison. <laughs> yeah, I thought two. about it. I mean, it's it's expensive. Um, yeah. My concern, no yeah, my concern with the L Extreme, and I talked about this a little bit in my last presentation, um, is it is really narrow um, band, and I guess it's not so bad. Uh, so one of the things you have to remember about narrow band filters is 
there's an angular dependence. When they tell you how wide the band is, it's based on light coming in parallel. But in fact, your light is being focused. So you actually lose bandwidth. So uh, at f6.3, I'm losing some of that bandwidth. If you go the L extreme, which is very narrow anyway, and you lose more bandwidth, you might only be getting 30% uh, of say the hydrogen alpha signal through. So you really cut down on that, that signal. You increase the contrast, but you really cut down your signal. And then I think you're gonna be forced into longer exposures. And I don't know, <laughs> you know, people have talked about this and say you get better images with, with uh, you know more extreme filters, but uh, I I I'm I guess I'm I'm a little bit on the fence whether. So I, I've done, so I, I I've got both filters and I've, yeah. I've done this I've done this experiment. Yeah. Uh, my, okay. my my setup is f five, okay. just over f five f five yeah. two or something. Um, and here's what I've noticed. So on yeah. galaxy images, yeah. the L enhance outperforms the L extreme. Yeah just because of your comment with regards to signal, the signal yep. overall signal law. Yes. Yep. But on Nebula, the yep. difference is astounding. Oh, really? On Nebula, the performance is far better on the L extreme than it is on the L enhance. And that's generally been my experience. Wow. On open clusters, yep. like, uh, or globular clusters, yep. I would go with the L uh, enhance. Yep. But for sure on Nebula, um, yeah, the L extreme is, is, does a, a, a very good wow. job. Wow, you just cost me money. <laughs> well, that's just my observation. Just that yeah, that's you had another thing to play around with. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's great. That's great information because I, I I was really wondering about this this trade off between the two. So that's that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Get together and try each other's filters. <laughs> Rick makes it. Oh yeah, I like comment. the It's good to share because they are they're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and they get you know if you have and if you're doing monochrome and you're doing narrow band imaging with monochrome yeah check that out <laughs> yeah 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 um sort of a Robert has a comment right. yeah robert can you unmute perhaps not well, he says, I've invested in a uh, Radian Triad Ultra Narrow Band 2-inch filter. I'm about okay. to start testing it very soon. Do you have any experience with this filter? And do you think there might be a scenario where L Enhanced filter might be more helpful, comma, useful, question mark? Uh, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not so familiar with it. I think it's, it's similar, but it might be narrow band than mine. So I think, you know, some of the conversation we've been having about you know, narrow band versus wider bands is, is relevant, but no, I, I, I have no experience, so I can't say anything specific. Mm -hmm. But I think the concept is similar. Um, and I, I think the, the tri-band just means that it separates out the hydrogen data from, from, from the O3, mm -hmm. which I, I don't think is such a big deal. You know. Thank, thanks very much, Rick. That, that, was, uh, that was really, uh, really pretty wild. Um, I'd like to ask Shreya, who managed to make it through the Zoom filters and has joined us. Uh, perhaps she can share her screen and unmute. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Shreya. Um, Shreya is going to talk about the skies this summer. Okay, I'm just gonna pull up my presentation. Yeah, when uh, when I noticed that you didn't make it on, we uh, asked Rick to go first, but uh, that's great that mm -hmm. you did manage to get it on. Okay. <clears throat> so I hope everyone can see this. I'm just gonna click slideshow and yep. hear me well as well. We can hear you and we can see you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Alan. Thanks, Rick. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, as Alan said, I'll be talking about the skies this summer, especially for August um, after today. So 
after today, there's not uh, much interesting things going on. So let's just talk about what has happened so far this, uh, this summer. <laughs> Um, so we got the double shadow transit on Jupiter that happened on August 8th. Um, then we got the Perseid meteors that happened on August 12th. And then we got Neptune, Jupiter, and Uranus all within the five degree field of view um, of the gibbous moon. So if anyone has any pictures or images, especially of the meteors that happened, um, please email uh, the email listed below as this would greatly support our pages online for our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If anyone has any images they would like to share. And yeah, um, okay, so coming up in August, this is what's happening after today. So we got the summer triangle um, that's happening from August 18th to the 31st. And the stars, um, they're Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Then we got Mars three degrees south of the quarter moon. Uh, Venus, four degrees south of crescent moon, happening on August 25th. And then we got Mercury at its greatest elongation east, happening on August 27th. And so that's it for August. As you can see, not in, in, anything interesting, too interesting. So maybe uh, September will have something interesting for us, hopefully. Um, so I decided to do some observing tips um, for those um, who have not really used their observer's handbook or just a quick reminder for those. Um, so we got some deep sky observing hints. That's on page 85. Um, there's a great summary of the planets um, in 2022 on page 207. Uh, we got some lunar observing uh, on page 158. And then we got all these planets on all these pages. Uh, these pages include information on the planets and how to safely observe them. And if you would like, at a glance, um, the August events, it's on page 113. And of course, more information is provided on page 112. And that's everything. Thank you. Thanks, Rhea. Thank you. Um, could would you mind uh, cutting and pasting the uh, email address into the chat window? So of course, I'll do that. Grab it. That's great. Thank Thanks. Thank you. All right, that's excellent. Uh, next up, we have a fellow named John Marchese. Most of you don't know him. He's a new member. He's only been around for fifty years. Um, he's going to talk about Lagrange points which is most apropos since we have a new telescope that went out to a Lagrange point, which I'm sure he will mention. So John, if you wanna take it away. Uh, thanks, Alan. Really a new telescope? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, as uh, Alan speculated, uh, that is what, uh, what gave me the idea to give this presentation. Um, I actually gave the same presentation back in 2010, and I'm trying to get my. Uh, it's not the same one because there wasn't a telescope out there. Uh, yeah, but there were other things back then. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I gave it back then, and then I thought to myself, you know what? I don't remember how they work, so maybe other people. Uh, so I looked up the presentation, and I thought, oh, okay, that's how they work, and I thought maybe others would be interested in uh, getting a refresher on that, and. Uh, so, so here we are. Um, okay, let me see if I could share my screen. Last time I did this at a Zoom meeting, I had all kinds of trouble. And make sure uh, you share the right screen. Yes, I know. You yeah, I mean the left one. One of them. Okay, that's the one I want. And let me open the presentation. Your picture looks like you should have lines across the back because it's. Uh after you've been arrested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see that? No, nope, I see your face. Oh, your smiling on. face. You don't see that either, right? No, nope, we just see your face. Alan, can we go to plan B and you read okay. the presentation from, uh, that I emailed to you, please? Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll have a... You can be my assistant. Okay. I was going to use another word, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Uh, well, that's is interesting because now I have to do it from here, which is really weird. Uh, give me a sec, guys. Don't want that. No. Okay. Okay, while you find that, I, I'm just going to start talking. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm sure that most of you have heard about the James Webb, Webb Space Telescope, and uh, you've probably heard that it, it's at L2, Lagrange Point 2, and you might be wondering, what is L2? Uh, a guy named, uh, uh, what's his first name? Louis Lagrange? Uh, French Joseph. 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 Ah, Joseph Way. Okay. Uh, Lagrange, uh, back in the 1700s, uh, actually figured it out, not by finding a Lagrange point and said, hmm, how does this work? Uh, he actually figured it out where they should be from theory, the hard way, the real hard way to do it. <laughs> and uh, which, which to me is pretty remarkable, actually. Uh, how are we doing there, Alan? Well, you've given me an interesting, my problem is that, yeah, anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get there in a second, I think. Okay. Okay. I'll keep talking. Um, if you think about, okay, first of all, I hope everybody has heard of uh, Lagrange points. And, um, but basically it's, it's a spot. If you think about the earth and the sun as a system, um, there's a spot in between the two where basically the gravity between uh, one and the other cancel each other out and that object stays close. Like in the case of L1, it's about a million, 1.5 million kilometers uh, uh, from the sun, so it's from the earth towards the sun, but closer to the earth, of course. So at that, anything at that spot will tend to hang at that spot. Uh, but then there's also L2, which is on the opposite side of the sun, which is the place where the JWST is going. Uh, sorry, on the opposite me anyway. And I thought, how does that work? And it turns out that there's L3, which is on the far side side of the sun, and um, also not very intuitive. And then there's L3, sorry, L4 and L5, which are at, uh... okay. <laughs> so um, it basically uh, you have to think of the, uh, of any object that's orbiting around the sun. Um, if it's close to the earth, um, it's still going to be influenced by the fact that it's going around the sun and, and, and the way, uh, the way objects orbit around the sun, boy, this is hard to do without the presentation. Actually, I can look at mine, even though I can't show it to you. Uh, so as objects uh, go around the sun, uh, the main factor that governs uh, the period or how long it takes to orbit the sun is how far they are from the sun. And, um, the closer objects like Mercury uh, and Venus, of course, uh, they orbit the sun much more quickly and the farther away, then it's much more slowly. Um, they take uh, the equivalent of years. Like for instance, uh, uh, Neptune takes, I don't know, 150 years or something. So, and- uh, We can see your presentation if you want, John. Oh, how come I can't see it? Great. I can. You're not allowed. I'm, so are you seeing my version or Alan's version? I wonder. It's oh, Alan's, Alan's version. Alan's okay, version. good. John, do you need to be live, not with your photo up? Um, I thought I was. Matter from his point of no, view. The screen you is just being got shared. a photo up. You're not live. Okay. Maybe that's why. I don't know. You see me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, so you can see the presentation. That's good. Okay, let's go. Can you go back to the uh, back to the beginning, Alan, please? Okay. No. Well, okay. One more. So uh, we already talked about uh, uh, Lagrange, the uh, mathematician. There were no astronomers back then, apparently. They were all mathematicians. Uh, he discovered the five Lagrange points. Uh, next, please. But before we get into Lagrange points, we need to understand a little bit about orbital mechanics and how things orbit uh, the sun. And so we have to go to Johannes Kepler, who uh, uh, was a German mathematician and astronomer. Actually, they did, they did call him an astronomer and an astrologer, interestingly. But this isn't so much about that. 
Uh, next to the slide. So Kepler came up with three laws of planetary motions. The first one is that the orbit of every planet is an ellipse with the sun at one of the two foci. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, next slide, Alan. Um, a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Now, all that means basically is that uh, when, when the object going around the sun is, is it one of the farthest part, further part of its orbit, oh, thank you, it, uh, it speeds up. And when it's closer, it slows down. And if you were to look at the area, um, if you look at a photo, you would see that the areas are the same. Uh, in other words, if it's further out, it has to go a little bit faster to make sure that that area that it sweeps out is the same as, you know, no matter what distance actually. Okay, next slide. Okay, the square of the orbital period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Now, how's that for a mouthful? Okay, next slide. Okay, all that really boils down to is the planet speeds up when farther and slows down when closer to the sun. And uh, next slide, please. So the third law is the one that really is really important regarding Lagrange points. Uh, it implies that a period for a planet to orbit the sun increases rapidly with the radius of its orbit. In other words, the further, you know, the, the, the faster it has to orbit. Thus, we find that Mercury, the innermost planet, takes only 88 days to orbit the Sun. The Earth takes 365, of course. And Saturn, for instance, takes uh, 10,000, almost 11,000 days to do the same. Um, so any, question, any more questions on Kepler's laws before we move on? Okay, Joseph Louis Lagrange. Oop. Next one, please. Okay, back to Lagrange again. So he, he discovered these five points. I mean, if this is the sun and this is the earth, there's L1 on the inside. Uh, it's actually closer to the earth than this and shown here. There's L2 on the other side, L3 way over here. And if you drew a line from the sun to the earth, they're all on that same line. And L4 and L5 are out here, okay? So all of these points uh, orbit the sun, of course. Anyway, next slide, please. Okay, this one basically shows you the angle. So it turns out that the angle for L4 and L5 are about 60 degrees from that straight line that goes through the Earth's sun. There's L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. And Lagrange points in a two-body system. So this is called a two-body system with one body far more massive than the other. Next slide, please. The five Lagrange points exist in the same relative positions around all major bodies in our solar system, where one body orbits a more massive body. So there are Lagrange points in the Earth-Sun system, the Mars sun system, the Jupiter sun system, and so on. All the planets, actually. There are also Lagrange points in the Earth moon system, which I wasn't aware of. We will only focus on the Earth sun system in this presentation. Next slide. L1. Okay, this is the one that's in between the sun and the Earth, which, as I said, I think is pretty intuitive. It lies on that line defined by the two masses, the Sun-Earth line. It's 1.5 kilometers from the Earth, which is about 1 one hundredth of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Next slide. It's at, uh, L1, as I said, is uh, 1.5 kilometers closer to the Sun than the Earth's orbit. And it would normally have a slightly short, uh, shorter orbital period than the Earth. So remember Kepler's Earth, uh, third law. So if anything was there at that spot, technically based on Kepler's laws, it should uh, orbit more quickly uh, than, uh, than the Earth. And therefore they would never be in sync. 
but that isn't the case. What happens is that the Earth's gravity weakens the force of the sun's gravity on an object at L1. This increases the object's orbital period so that it's equal to the, Earth, to the Earth's orbital period. So like I said, I find this one quite intuitive because it's in between the two and, and it's, it's always there. Next slide. L2 and L through L5. These only exist in rotating systems such as the Earth's sun. At these points, the combined attraction from the two masses is equivalent to what would be exerted by a single mass at the very center of the system, sufficient to cause a small body to orbit with the same period. The very center is the center of the mass of the two or more celestial objects that orbit them, uh, each other. Uh, so basically, if you think of the, the sun and the earth, uh, the very center is where the, uh, is where the, uh, if you look at the two as a system where the center of gravity is the two. And the very center, center of the earth's sun, for instance, is actually inside the sun still, not at the center of the sun, of course, but part way out. Uh, I think it's the same with the earth moon system. Their very center is probably, I would guess, some side, some uh, someplace inside the Earth, uh, as opposed to out further in between. Um, but we'll we'll get more into detail of these as we go through them one at a time. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about L two next. Next slide, please. It lies on that same line defined. Be, uh, you know, the Earth's sun line, and it's also 1.5 kilometers from the Earth. Next slide. An object orbiting 1.5 kilometers further from the sun than the Earth's orbit, this would normally have a slightly longer orbital period than the Earth. And once again, Kepler's law, right? But the extra pull of Earth's gravity on that object at L2 will decrease its period so that it's equal to the Earth's orbital period. So when you think of it this way, it makes sense. At least it does to me anyway. Okay, next slide. Now, next we're gonna to go to L3, next slide. It lies on that same line, the Earth-Sun line. It's about 150 kilometers from the sun opposite the Earth. Uh, the combined pull of the Earth and Sun causes an object of L3 to orbit the Sun with the same orbital period as the Earth. Now, everywhere that I looked for an explanation, I didn't find that this quite con convincing to me anyway. Uh, and I've, I've always also wondered if, I mean, the Earth-Sun system is on average about 150 kilometers, million kilometers as well, but it can range between uh, two and a half million kilometers more or less than that too. So, uh, so I'm not sure if it's the exact opposite of where the Earth is or it's it's slightly closer in, John. It is slightly closer yeah. in. Okay, thanks. I didn't know that, and I, I like I said, I couldn't find a, an explanation about in the places that I looked. So, um, so so that explains that one. Uh, next, please. Okay, we're going to talk about L4 and L5 next. Next slide, please. These lie at the third corners of two equilateral triangles in the plane of orbit whose common base is the line between the centers of the sun and the earth, such that the point lies behind L5 or ahead L4 of the earth about its orbit around the sun. <laughs> a bit of a mouthful. Next slide. So these points are in balance because at L4 and L5, the distances to the sun and the earth are equal. Accordingly, the gravitational force, forces from the sun and the earth are in the same ratio as their masses. And so the resultant force acts through the very center of the system. Yeah, I, when, I, when I looked at, uh, okay, the next slide, please. 
Yeah, so there's the very center of the sun and the earth. I'm not sure why they put the sun in blue and the earth in gray, but anyway, so so as you can see, there's the very center. I had that, a hard that, time. What's that's that? the earth and moon, John. That's that the picture's earth. the earth and moon. Oh, oh it's the earth that's and moon. moon. Oh, the yeah, earth. yeah, okay, that makes sense. Okay, that's yeah. blue, okay. So uh, so in the case of, yeah, I, I, I guess I made a bad, bad choice of pictures here. So. Um, so, so, the, uh, so this is an equilateral triangle here, and but the very center is here. And the fact that it's off by that, that the force of gravity be between the two equalizes and it just modifies that orbit enough that it ends up being steady. And it's always that distance as it goes around. So that's it. That's the best that I can understand it anyway. Objects at L1, L2, and L3 are metastable. It's like a ball sitting at the top of a hill. Frequent correcting action or station keeping is required to keep these objects in place. Objects at L3 are even less stable because they would be strongly influenced by Venus. Although I'm not sure why Venus wouldn't uh, influence L2 as well, but I'll, I can accept that. Uh, next slide. Objects in L4 and L5 are very stable, like a ball sitting at the bottom of the bowl. Dust and other objects often become, become trapped at L4 and L5, especially Jupiter's, which contain the Trojan asteroids. Next slide. Since objects at L1 are never shadowed by the Earth and the Moon, L1 is ideal for making observations of the sun. These include uh, SOHO, uh, ACE, and DISCOVER. These I'm quite familiar with. This one I hadn't heard of. Next slide. Because it is effectively shielded from the sun, L2 is a good spot for space-based observatories. And these include uh, WMAP, Herschel, Planck, which I think is decommissioned now, and now the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's 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 good to have the uh, both the Earth and the Sun behind you, and looking out always looking out away from the two of them, the way the uh, JWST is positioned. Uh, you might wonder if uh, Earth wouldn't shadow. But that doesn't happen for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, because it's it's so it's far enough away at one and a half kilometers that uh, there there wouldn't be any shadow at that point. Uh, the other reason being that uh, because of the fact that it's a metastable orbit at, at that point, sorry, uh, where it's like being at the top of the hill and they have to do station keeping, that means they actually have to power the uh, the, uh, the objects there. Uh, the observatories there so that they're essentially orbiting uh, L2. They're not exactly at the center of L2. So, uh, next slide. I think that's it, actually. Oh, yeah, L3. Ah, yeah, a great hiding place for Planet X in science fiction until, you know, the uh, sp spacecraft were actually able to see behind it and prove that it doesn't exist. Uh, next slide. Yeah, L4 and L5, they will make a good location for space stations in the future. And I think that's it now. Yeah, the end. So I'm not being, not really a, a physicist. Actually, I'm not a physicist at all. I'm an amateur physicist. I've, uh, there, there's, I have a curiosity of about uh, a lot of things, especially uh, orbital, orbital mechanics. And I just take it upon myself to try to understand them as best I can. Uh, even though it's not perfect, it still helps me to, to, to have a good idea. And I'm sure a physicist would have done a much better job, but, but that's the best I could do. Thanks. That's great, John. Thank you. Yes, lots of clapping. <laughs> 
And now we have, thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I do that. So Brian is going to give a talk on a new mount. Right. Um, and I'm just going to click share screen now, Alan. Yes, please. And I've got two screens, but I think once I start the slideshow, you're going to get to see it anyhow. We'll hope. I, I know I did it before with the two screens set up, and I don't think I had any problem. Right. When you share, you simply have to indicate which one you want to share. All right. Here we go. That's the one. Okay, you're seeing it? Yep. All right, I'm going to hit play slideshow. Oh, uh, yep, good. Okay, good. Yeah, I can see it too. All right, so about just before Christmas last year, ZWO, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with them, but they're the guys that make a lot of the cameras, the ASI whole series of cooled cameras and um, guiding cameras. Uh, they make all kinds of accessories that go along with that stuff. They even have a little guide uh, scope, 30 millimeter that they have. But this is their first entry into a mount. So <clears throat> this particular mount, for whatever reason, they call it the AM5. What's unique about it is that it's a harmonic drive. And I'll explain that in a second. It's an equatorial mount, but it actually works in Altaz configuration as well. So the picture here is just one I stole from their website that shows the actual mount head itself. But I've got some better pictures here as I move through. So just to give you a sort of a little rundown on the mount itself, it can carry 30 kilograms, which is close to 30 pounds, I think, 25, 30 pounds, without any counterweight. So that's one of the big benefits of it. Um, you can actually, they, they rate it to 20 kilograms with a counterweight, but the only reason you need the counterweight at that point is to keep the whole thing from tipping over. <laughs> because if you have that much weight hanging off when it starts moving around, <clears throat> it's liable to tip over. But, it, the, but the mount itself doesn't need the counterweight to handle the weight. So these, these drives are high torque, they have low periodic error, zero backlash, and it's called a strain wave gear, which I'll show you in a second. <clears throat> they can slew at six degrees a second, so they're, they're quick enough. Um, the mount head only weighs five and a half kilograms, so that's like 11 pounds or so. So it's not bad, considering you don't have to take any counterweight bar or counterweights along with it. Um, the carbon fiber tripod that they designed for it, which you can see in the picture here, <clears throat> is kind of a low tripod. It's not too high, but it's very stable. And it only weighs 2.3 kilograms. So again, it doesn't add a lot to the, to the weight. Um, it has a dual Los Mandy Vixen saddle, which you can see on it. Um, it has a rather unusual little hand controller. It's more like a joystick. So it looks like something that belongs on a video game but it is handy, I'll explain. Um, the ASI mount itself, there's an app that's available, iOS, Android, for wireless control. So the mount itself has Wi-Fi, but it's in the hand controller. So you have to plug the hand controller in to, turn, to have Wi-Fi on the mount itself. Now, the other thing that ZWO make is the ASI Air that I think people you know, have probably heard of. It's been around for quite a while. It's in its sort of third iteration now or generation. Um, it works very well with this. You don't have to have it with this mount, but I do use it. And you can see it in my example, it's mounted on the side here. It's just, they actually have a finder shoe that comes on the side of the mount where you can slap this thing to just stick it on and have it attached. Um, so again, equatorial or at Altez configs, seamless integration with the ASI Air. It does have ASCOM, INV, you know, Sky Safari compatibility. You can do that with, even without the ASI Air on it. It uses LX200 settings, which just about every program has as an option, like Sky Safari, you can go in. It's just the command set that it happens to use for commands. And it operates on 
they recommend a 12 volt, five amp power supply as, as a minimum. <clears throat> and so I'm using a Celestron uh, lithium, you know, battery pack, the pro one, which is rated at 12 volts, five amps. And it powers both the mount and the Sky Safari or the uh, ASI Air on the side. So if you, if you actually Google a harmonic drive or a strain wave drive, you'll get all kinds of animations that kind of show how this works. This is just an image from one of those animations. But basically, this isn't new technology. The, the guy who patented this was in 57, and they first used them in machines in 1960. <laughs> so they've been around for a while. And in fact, harmonic drives like micron drives, I believe, have been around for quite a while but they're highly expensive. Like you're talking 10, like Paramount type drives, $10,000 and up. Um, if you look at uh, on the picture then, what you have is you have a system. So you have a flexible spline with external teeth. That's the red ring here. So if you think of it, this red gear is like a band and it flexes. The outer gear in blue is solid and it's circular, like a standard gear. And this yellow rotating elliptical plug in between, it actually bends and flexes the red gear. And what happens is each time it revolves, it moves one gear tooth. So this thing moves one gear at a time. That's why there's no backlash. So it, it can only ever move one gear at a time, as you can kind of see in the animation here where it's engaged. And when it does another loop, it would move one more gear over because of this flexing. So it's pretty unusual. Um, but unlike a worm gear, there's no backlash whatsoever because you've always got the teeth engaged. Um, these are used in robotics and aerospace. So that's really, when you see these images of robots lifting up boxes like they're nothing or heavy packages. It's because they have these type of gears within them and they have extreme torque. They can set gear ratios that are just crazy in terms of giving it um, the ability to, to uh, move heavy objects. Um, and in the case of ZWO, they actually test and give you a periodic error chart for every one of their individual drives because they've got a specific spec and they say the guiding accuracy will be between 0.5 and 0.8 arc seconds on all their drives. So they're kind of guaranteeing that as they ship them out. Um, and another thing that's kind of unique with them because Ioptron now has brought out a drive called the HEM27, which is also a harmonic drive but they only have one of these gears on the RA axis, whereas the ZWO drive has a harmonic gear for both the RA and the deck, which again, eliminates the need for any balancing in either axis. So I just took this, again, this is straight off of ZWO's website, um, but it just kind of shows some of the things. I won't go through it all, but. You know, a lot of it's pretty basic. That's the finder shoe where I said I stuck the uh, ASI air on the side. They also gave two, two screws up here where you could mount another finder shoe. And that's where I have my guide scope attached. So I actually, in the previous picture, the guide scope was sitting on the uh, telescope. But here, uh, now I'm using it mounted right on the side of the uh, saddle. Um, it's, it's got really nice controls for doing your polar alignment, for uh, adjusting it. Everything moves very slick, smooth. The, uh, um, these are the ports, which are all on the front plate. So there's a USB port. I currently have my ASI Air connected to the mount through that, but they can't even talk to each other wirelessly if you want, because the ASI Air Pro also has Wi-Fi. So some people just use Wi-Fi for them to connect as well. I have a, a cable plugged in here. This is the power cable on the other end. So that's your 12 volt power. And the hand controller goes in here. So those are the three main connections. You don't really need the auto guide port. It's just a standard ST4 port. Um, and there's the power button is up here on the side. It's just a single power button. Here. 
Let me ask. There. Again, this is just showing what comes in the box. The that's the carbon fiber tripod, so it's rated for fifty kilograms. <laughs> now, I have ordered the two of these little um, uh, pure extensions. Again, mainly because the the tripod it only has uh, one extension on each leg, and it's still fairly low. So I think the um, having a small pure extension it's only going to add about five inches to the height but it's a nice addition to it. So I have ordered that, but they're back ordered. And that's what it'll look like when it has the little pure extension on top of it. But you can stack them if you need more than two or you want it higher. Now, last night, like I've, I've now tested it, used it here for about a month. Uh, and again, I was telling Alan earlier, I'm in Thornbury, whoops, go back. I'm in Thornbury and this is sort of my longest stretch and we've had such great weather. So I've had all kinds of dark sky, moonless nights um, to play with it and to kind of go through and decide what works best. But um, it's amazing. As an example, last night when I had it out there, I swapped scopes without even stopping it from tracking. So literally <laughs> I had that first scope that you saw in the image, the five inch reflector was on there and I had an eyepiece in it and I was just looking through it. And then I wanted to try this tiny little 30 millimeter APO. <laughs> so yeah, that's, if you look at the picture, that's the telescope and that's the guide scope and they're the same size. They're both 30 millimeters. This one's got the camera on the back for auto guiding. And this one's got my Olympus full spectrum camera on it, but it's a 30 millimeter F 4.5. The focal length is 135 millimeters. So it's kind of crazy, but it's got six elements in there. <laughs> They're ED APO elements. And uh, you can see the, the uh, ASI air on the side as well. So yeah, the, this is the saddle for the mount. And you can see my little dovetail sticking out at the bottom. But uh, I'll show you an image taken last night with that. So these are just a couple of quick things in terms of my initial experience. Like I said, I've been using it for a month. It's very lightweight. I was able to even carry the whole thing out with that five inch reflector on it. I can pick the whole thing up, even with the battery. They have an actual bag in the bottom of the tripod for you to put your battery in, which is nice. So you could, I could pick the whole thing up, carry it out, stick it out there, and it's just rock solid when it does. Um, I've used it now with that 135 inky little telescope, the, the 130, which is a five inch reflector. I've got a, a 107, which is a four inch refractor that I've had on it. And I've had my RC8, which is the heaviest one I put on it. Cause that, that weighs about 20 pounds with everything on it. With, uh, with the, uh, and I used it with a 60 millimeter guide scope and it worked great. So I've put, I've had all of these on it. And uh, as I said, you don't even have to balance it in depth. You literally just stick it anywhere and off it goes. Um, polar aligning and guiding requires a guide scope and camera. That's one of the things though with this is that the, the mount itself does not have any kind of optical polar alignment scope. Um, it has that dovetail on the side where you could put a finder, you know, to try and do a polar alignment manually. But the best way to do a polar alignment is either through your main scope or through the guide scope um, using the ASI Air Pro. So my ASI or whatever app you're going to use. If you're a PC user, you can use uh, Indie or one of those other applications to do it. Um, but I'm doing it with the ASI Air Pro. And, I, and the nice thing about an ASI Air Pro is that it's all done wirelessly. I use my iPad. So everything is done from my iPad. There's no wires. I'm, I'm controlling everything with the iPad when I'm out there. But I'll show you a couple of screenshots just to give you a better idea what that's like. But I do the polar alignment. Um, I can do go-tos using the guide scope um, and it will plate solve and put it right on the object. Um, and then I use it for the guiding as well. So the guide scope becomes my guiding. And that's another thing with this 
I did with that little tiny scope, I did a two minute exposure and it was fine, everything was sharp, but really it's not ideal without guiding. So this mount is really, they recommend guiding unless you're doing 60 second exposures or less. Um, and, and I think that's true. It's because of the type of gear system. It guides great, but it really needs guiding. There's no, uh, well, I said here, it, it, uh, you need, there's the ASI mount app on the iPad. There's the ASI Air app, which I use, or you can use Sky Safari, just tap an object and send it to it. Um, it doesn't, it, it only has, whoops, forward again. It only has one, uh, you can only do like a one-star alignment with it. They haven't, they haven't actually developed multi-star alignment because typically people who use this use their main camera to send it to wherever and it'll do its own plate solving and, and centering. But if you're using it manually or visually, what I would do is I would do the polar alignment, then I would send it to an object. If it wasn't centered, I could then center the object, click on it to align the mount to the object. And then I was, it was pretty accurate to go to another object after that, one star alignment, and then off it would go. And, and I found good success with that. But people have been asking them to maybe put in a two or three star alignment option as well for people who are doing visual so that they can get a little more accurate uh, alignments. And uh, so that's pretty much it there. So here's a couple of screenshots. The ASI mount app, when you fire it up, pretty much just looks like what you see there. Um, and really it's, it's almost like, you know, a, a, a poor man's sky safari or something along those lines because you don't, you don't see a lot of detail there. But the minute you start zooming in, everything starts to come out at you. I'm just going to move something on my screen here because I'm blocking things. Um, but the buttons that you see, these are all touch points, like field of view, mount. So if you want to go in and update the firmware on the mount, you would tap on this button um, to get in there. You can see there's options over here to align to an object. The blue box is where the mount is currently sitting but you can, you can click on any object and it'll draw a red box around it. And then you can say, you know, uh, I wanna go to that box, right, to the cross. So this is, th this is usable, but the ASI Air app, which I'm gonna show you now, is, is that much um, easier to use. So, this is just when, when I first fire up the SI Air app with the mount connected, you can see the mount is up here where you choose your mount, your, your guiding or main focal length, et cetera, what camera you're using. Um, it can also work with uh, electronic focusers and filter wheels and all that, which I don't use. Again, I just use my Olympus camera now. I decided a cold camera or cooled camera <laughs> and taking all these subs and flats and biases was just too much work. So um, I'm just using the Olympus. And then this is the screen, once you enter, this is the screen you would drop into and you can switch between this view and all the various options by using the buttons on the side. You can click preview, it'll give you another menu. If you click on this little star chart down here, it'll bring up this next screen that I show here, which is the screen similar to the other app. So you can see how they're very similar. <clears throat> this one, I've moved the red box off a little bit. So if you were to say go to, the blue box would then shift over to the red box and it would, it would be uh, all very quick. And then last night when I was using it, this kind of shows you what it looks like when I'm actually auto guiding. So I was auto guiding with that little tiny telescope and the 30 millimeter guide scope. And all these little green circles here are all stars that it is monitoring for guiding. So it's got multi-star guiding. The one that it's actually sort of focused on is this one here. And again, these little boxes can be moved around. They're transparent or, or semi-transparent. So you see through them. But this one here is showing you the actual focus on the, the guide star. Whoops. Back up here. It's showing the actual focus on the guide star. And when you first go in to start, it calibrates. So it does a whole calibration routine, takes about five minutes. And then once it's done that, you can, you're good for the night. 
that you can move around to different parts of the sky and, and start guiding. But it gives you this, this running graph showing your R index and you can adjust the aggressiveness. But if you look at what's here, this was showing me at the time, my total guiding error was 0.48 seconds. That's total between the two, right? So the chart itself, it may look like it's bouncing around. That was me taking the picture of the screen and making the deck jiggle. <laughs> but basically the guiding is amazing that it, that it does. Um, and it, as it gets finer and finer and the error gets smaller, the graph keeps changing. You know, it keeps sort of giving you, so that you can still see what's going on. So it's, it's very intuitive the way they do it. Um, so now, what have I done with it? Well, here's a few sample images. So I just want to run through and show you some samples with the various scopes. So this was just to show you that it did guide fine with the big scope. This was with the RC8. So we're talking about, I'm now with my camera, which is micro four thirds, this would be shooting probably at the equivalent of about 2200 millimeters, right, focal length. Um, I do have a reducer on the back of the, uh, I have a reducer on the back of the RC8, um, but even still, um, it's probably takes it down to maybe 1200 millimeters. And then you got to double that with my small sensor camera. But anyhow, this, this is, um, this particular image here is a single exposure. <laughs> now that's another benefit of being up here. This is, I'm under Bortle four skies. This is one eight minute exposure. So I just took one shot basically. And with the guiding turned on at 22 or 2400 millimeters, um, one, one exposure. So you'll see all the pictures I'm gonna show you, nothing is more than 11 minutes. <laughs> That's why I was kind of, I, 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 I mean, I, I have nothing but, uh, Praise for the guys who spend hours and hours in collecting, but I just, I just don't have that kind of patience anymore, for sure. So, <laughs> so I'm sort of the quick and dirty uh, type. But anyhow, yeah, I was I was pleased with that of the dumbbell. Um, this was with that little reflector, the the 130 millimeter. Now it's f 2.8, so uh, I can't remember. I didn't go back and look at all these. Some of these are a stack. I think this was a stack of um, 10 60 second exposures because that's the other way I do it. My camera allows me to go push the ISO up higher, but only when I use 60 second exposures or or you know in that or or just bulb itself. But I have a live composite option on the camera where I can watch the image build. But when I use it, it will only let me go a maximum of eight minutes and I can only use ISO 1600 max. But I will do that. I will use 1600 and go eight minutes <laughs> sometimes. Depends on the object, but that's the Pac-Man with the little reflector. This was with the four inch refractor. And this is nine minutes. This is nine 60 second exposures at 6400 ISO, that's it. And just stacked in Photoshop. And because of the guiding, when I stack this in Photoshop, I don't have to do any alignment. These images are one on top of the other, exactly. I just literally grab the nine images. Like I, I come from Lightroom and I say, okay, open them as layers in Photoshop. Then I grab all the layers. I say, make it a smart object. And then I say, do a median combine on it. And that's it. That's how I merge them. And uh, there's no, I did not use any noise reduction in the camera. I do use topaz denoise on the final image when I'm done, but that's it. So no dark frames, no noise reduction in camera, which I could turn on, but again, it slows things down. So that's just, and when you were talking about a satellite or a plane going through the images, even though I'm up here, the reason there was nine minutes in this one and not 10 was because on the one of the exposures, a jet literally flew right across the nebula. And there was like two bright red lines that literally cut through it in a 60 second exposure. So it, it can happen anywhere. Because when you consider what a small spot in the sky that was, the same night I did this, that's the Omega Nebula. That one again, you know, like 10 images, um, 10 minutes, basically exposure. Um, 
And this was the one I took last night with that little tiny 30 millimeter telescope. <laughs> so this is a single eight minute exposure and uh, taken with that little uh, 30 millimeter telescope. The sky was not really black, it was kind of haze. That's why I think I got a little bit of funny color in the background because of the sky last night, it wasn't perfectly clear like the other nights. But again, it was kind of a test. This is not cropped at all. So this was like, you know, I was kind of looking to see, okay, how is this thing to the, you know, the stars and the corners and everything. Um, it's great. The colors, this is that, um, they call it the, uh, this is the elephant's trunk, the garnet star. That's what this one with the bright orangey color. But there's a lot of dark nebula all in around this area too. But this was kind of a test. I was actually out looking to see if there was going to be any aurora activity last night because they've been talking about it all this weekend and it really hasn't materialized yet to any great extent. But I thought while I'm out there, I want to try this little guy and see what happens. So. Yeah, that was with the uh, the little 135. And again, same camera for all these. But needless to say, this thing has performed so well um, that I sold my CEM40, which was the ioptron mount. Because again, if I put the RC8 on the, on the CEM40, I had to use two 11 pound counterweights plus a 10 inch extension bar on the counterweight bar to get the whole thing to balance. I mean, I didn't need much of the extension, but I literally had to put those two counterweights just slightly onto the extension bar in order to make it balance. Whereas with this thing, I, I don't need it at all. Literally just set that same weight on top of it and it'll move it around like it's nothing. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. And they've also, ZWO basically and Ioptron have brought the price of harmonic drives into the same price range as like the CEM40. In fact, it's probably less than the CEM40 for this mount now. But uh, anyhow, it, it, it really, you know, has been great and it's really cut the weight. So, you know, I'm much more likely to take this off site even just because I don't have as much to carry. And I think that was it, so. I don't know if there's some questions. Well, wow, that was pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> so it, dare I ask, uh, rough numbers, what, what it's worth? I think the, the mount is about 2,500 bucks. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like I said, it's in the same, and the tripod, the tripod is like 400 bucks, the, oh, okay. the carbon fiber one that they have with it. So it's not, it's not bad at all. Um, I mean, if you, their, their cameras are very reasonable. The ASI Air Pro, I think is, a, their, their ASI Airs are like 400 bucks or something for those 300, 400 bucks, but they, they work so well, you know, it's totally integrated. So yeah, it's, uh, and because, because you're doing everything with an iPad too, it's, and, and I, the one night I used it, when we did uh, two other guys and I took it, down and set it up uh, down by the water. That's when I took the shots of the eagle and the, cause I can't see the Southern sky from my deck. So I'd gone down there. We used the thing for several hours. I mean, even though I was using the iPad too, I was uh, um, basically uh, still the iPad, it was like at 70, 70 some percent when I, uh, when I was done. So it doesn't, doesn't, it, it, what you have to realize the iPad is really just a user interface. Sure. You know, all the, all the processing goes on in the little ASI Air box, which is, you know, one of these Raspberry Pi boxes. Um, and I mean, it even has, that little box even has 12 volt power outlets on it. If you want to use do, do heaters or whatever, you can run them off of that. You can even through the app, you can set the, the heat level. So you can control you know, low, medium, high for the ports and turn the individual ports on and off. So it's really evolved. Uh, to a point where it's it's really well integrated, and like I said, if you if you put one of their focusers on your scope, it'll do everything. It'll like so again, a lot of guys that use ASI Air do take whole night exposures on one object. They set up their scope, they have the filter wheel, and the whole process can be automated through that. 
I just, I don't do that. I mainly use it for polar alignment and guiding now, but um, as I said, it's, uh, you know, I think harmonic drives after this, you know, just using it for a month are kind of the future. Not that the equatorial mounts, there's anything wrong with them, but um, certainly even with my ioptrons, you had to be careful that you didn't, you know, wreck the gears. And, you know, they have like this, this mount has no clutches. So that's one thing you have to remember is at the end of the night, you have to tell it to go home to put it back in the home position before you shut it off because you can't move it any other way. There's no manual clutches to release. You can't release the gears. So it has to go under power back to its home position before you put it away. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> so don't run out of battery. Yeah, don't run out of battery. That's, that's pretty wild, Brian. Thank you very much. Yes, everyone's uh, <laughs> clapping, clapping with little icons. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, John, um, that we have a note that you will give a brief update on our plans for Starfest 2020. I know that um, some of the members are going to stay on to this call. I'll stop the recording, but some of them will stay on afterwards to give a brief uh, talk about meeting up at Starfest. Uh, but if did you want to talk about anything, John? Um, uh, Starfest is is next week, as as most of you probably know. Technically, it's or August twenty fifth to twenty eighth, but I think it starts earlier. But that's okay. At River Place Campground, John is still muted. There he is. I cover that in my presentation, Alan. My oh. five minutes. Now I'm only going to need four and a half minutes. Okay, well go. Uh, okay. Are you going to be able to share your screen, John? Uh, let me try again. You never know. Right. It might work this time. Share screen. Okay. 